Welcome everyone. It's uh, 11 a.m. in Toronto. It's 6 p.m. Uh, here in uh, Jerusalem. If there's anybody on the West Coast, uh, it's uh, it's 8 a.m. Uh, for you. Good morning. Uh, good morning to you. And uh, we are beginning a series of uh, eight sessions entitled Parshanut and Polemics. Uh, Rabbi Kelman suggested that I introduce myself. He can't be here right now. He's, uh, he's teaching. Uh, my name is Marty Lakshan. I live in Jerusalem. I taught at York University in Toronto for, uh, for 38 years as a full-time faculty member. And I still teach, uh, teach there now as a retiree over the, uh, uh, over the internet. I'm interested in, uh, in Bible commentaries. I'm interested in uh, the discussions and arguments that took place between Judaism and Christianity over the ages. And I'm interested in the intersection of those two topics, Bible commentaries and arguments between Jews and Christians about the proper understanding of the Bible. And that's what our sessions will be dealing with. Um, I'm gonna share a screen with you with some text and we'll get to work. The, from time to time, a Jewish writer will say, uh, the Christians say the following about the text, and that's wrong because of the following. But actually, that happens very rarely. And our job as uh, students, as scholars, as uh, people who are interested in reading classical Jewish texts is to figure out when they talk about a text and they don't say that they're arguing with the Christians, is it reasonable to think that they are arguing with the Christians? So, you know, how often can we make that a jump and say, oh, the rabbi who wrote this text wrote that because he knows what the Christians say and he is trying to disagree with the Christians. We will keep this question in our mind over the next eight weeks, how to, uh, how to determine the, when there is a polemic, when there is an argument against Christianity. My teacher, Professor David Berger once wrote, in matters of exegetical detail, if you're talking about a specific comment about a specific verse in the Bible, in matters of exegetical detail, Polemical motives are occasionally obvious, occasionally likely, and occasionally asserted implausibly. So <laughs> we, we have three possibilities. We look at some comments of some rabbi. We look at something that Rashi said, and then we say to ourselves, did Rashi say that because he knew what the Christians said and he was trying to disagree with the Christians? Uh, well, sometimes when you say that, it's obvious, oh, he must have been doing that. And sometimes it's likely, and sometimes the assertion is made very implausibly. This is an issue uh, that, that's discussed quite a bit in uh, scholarly literature uh, today. Uh, and that this is the issue that we will be looking at over a sweep of centuries in this course. And I guess the first question that we have to uh, ask ourselves is how much did the cl cl classical rabbis and the medieval rabbis actually know about Christianity? Did, did they read the New Testament? Did they, did they, in, in, could they read Greek or Latin, which was necessary in order to be able to read the, the New Testament until a, a pretty late time in medieval times when the New Testament started to be tra translated into, uh, into the vernacular, into the languages other than, uh, other than Greek and Latin. Um, how often did they have meaningful discussions with Christians in order to be able to, uh, to acquire knowledge about Christianity? Uh, and they, Second question to keep in mind as we go through this course is, did the rabbis see Christianity as an intellectual as opposed to a physical threat? 
So there were times in Jewish history, many times in Jewish history, where Christianity was seen as a physical threat to, uh, to, to Jews in times of uh, pogroms and the times of the Crusades and, and, and uh, when blood libels were taking place. But that's not what we're dealing with in this course. We're dealing with the, with the intellectual question of who's offering a better interpretation of the Bible. Uh, it, it, it has been argued that the, uh, uh, back up a second, Winston Churchill once said that uh, the United States and England are two countries that are separated by the fact that they have a shared language. Uh, that it, you know, the fact that they have a shared language in, in essence is not, <laughs> They use the language very differently in the United States and in the United Kingdom, uh, and so they're separated by that. And so some people have said that the same thing can be said about Judaism and Christianity. Judaism and Christianity are two religions that are separated by the fact that they have a shared holy book that we call the Tanakh and that the Christians call uh, the, Old, uh, the Old Testament. But how, how aware were Jews about what the Christians were claiming, uh, how how much of a uh, how, how much of a threat did rabbis in Talmudic times and rabbis in medieval times see uh, in in, Christi in Christianity? Um, so we look through these texts and we try to find uh, words that are key words that will let us uh, say, oh, the rabbis must be reacting to Christianity in some sense. And often the key word is the word mean that appears at the bottom of the, uh, of the slide here. And the question is, what does the word mean actually mean? Uh, mean uh, literally means a sectarian. And often, as we will see beginning today and in many uh, texts that we will look at, the word mean means a, a Christian, because the Christians began, of course, as a sect of Judaism. And some ancient Jewish texts, some classical Jewish texts, some Talmudic texts refer to the Christians as the minim. There is, I'll just share with you, again, this is something that I learned from, uh, from my teacher, Professor David Berger, that there's a folk etymology. But before I tell you the folk etymology, I have to tell you, this isn't true. This isn't, this isn't the meaning of the word mem yud nun that means mean, but there's a folk etymology that the letters, the Hebrew letters mem yud nun stand for ma'amin yeshu notzri. Uh, the, a person who believes in Jesus of Nazareth. As I said, that's not the correct etymology of the word uh, uh, of the word mean. Uh, and uh, for those of you who know any Hebrew, of course, you know that the word mean has many different meanings to it, other than sectarian. And uh, my father, Zichronoli uh, Bracha, once bought a, uh, a very old. Uh, Mish, uh, Mishnah set uh, from, I don't really remember how old it was, but it, the censor had gone through the book and had crossed out any time that the word mean appeared in the book, thinking that it might be a reference to Christianity. And even when it meant species or the modern Hebrew, of course, mean uh, can, can also refer to, refer to sexuality, uh, but, but the, the word mean uh, can mean species and have nothing to do with sec sectarianism. Mean de when two, uh, two, uh, two things mixed together, are they from the same species or from two different categories? So, so we have a problem. We don't have a clear word that means Christians in the earliest rabbinic text. And that's what we're going to start with today. We're going to start looking at the earliest rabbinic texts from Talmudic times and see if we can find some texts that talk about, that, that give us an idea of what the rabbis uh, are saying about Christianity that show us a confrontation between the rabbis and Christianity. Okay, so the first text that we're going to look at here that will kind of demonstrate the difficulty of this word mean for a sectarian. So the text in the Talmud and Shabbat 
reads, Shalu minin the Rabban Gamliel minayin shakadosh baruchu mechaye metim. Amar lahem mina Torah, umina nviim, umina ktuvim, velo kiblu heimeno. The minim once asked Rabban Gamliel for a source for the belief that God resurrects the dead. And Rabban Gamliel gave them proofs from the Torah, from the prophets, and from the writings, and they would not accept his proofs. So here we have a text that is talking about an argument between a first century rabbi, Rabban Gamliel, in the land of Israel, who's arguing with Minim, trying to prove to them the concept of the resurrection of the, of the dead, and uh, they are not willing to accept. So, so we have a discussion here between somebody who's like from the establishment of the rabbis arguing with a with some sectarians about the interpretation of the bible and are arguing whether uh whether the bible actually sa uh, teaches the resurrection of the dead i begin with this uh, with this example because this is a text that in which the word minim could not mean christians because the christians Definitely, from the beginning, the Christians believed in the resurrection of the dead. So this is kind of a cautionary text for us, that we see an argument between the rabbis and the minim. We shouldn't say right away, this is the ar an argument between rabbis and the, and, and the Christians, because here, here, minim could not mean Christians. And just to prove to you that minim could not mean uh, Christians, there's a... Uh, interesting passage in the New Testament in the 23rd chapter of Acts when uh, Paul is caught by some Jewish council and they're worrying that he is a uh, that, that he's a heretic uh, and he feels that he's in trouble uh, Paul tries, according to this passage in, in, uh, in Acts, Paul tries the old strategy of divide and conquer. When Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Brethren, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. Res with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead, I am on trial. So Paul saw that the people who were blaming him for not being a proper Jew were actually of two factions, the Pharisee faction, the Pharisees who went on to become the rabbis, the uh, founders of rabbinic Judaism as we know it, and the other group, the strong group in the beginning of the first century uh, Jewish group in the land of Israel were the Sadducees. And so he, he said, you know why they don't like me? They don't like me because I'm a Pharisee. And I believe in the resurrection of the dead. And when he said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirits. So the, uh, the, the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. They don't believe in angels. Uh, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. And then a great clamor arose, as they, according to the book of Acts, and some of the scribes of the Pharisees' party stood up and contended, we find nothing wrong in this man. It's, you know, the, the, the only reason people are complaining about, it, the, about him, the Sadducees are complaining about him. And so, so uh, Paul managed kind of to disguise himself as, a, as being a Pharisee and calls himself a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. And why is he calling himself a Pharisee? Because uh, the hope in the, of the resurrection of the dead is something that I share with the uh, with the uh, Pharisees and the sad. So 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 just going back to the previous text, if there's an argument going on between Minim and Rabban Gamliel about uh, whether the Bible teaches the resurrection of the dead, this could not be an example of an argument between. Jews and Christians. So we began with a text in which uh, using uh, Professor Berger's three uh, categories, obvious, uh, likely, or implausible. Here it's implausible. To, to say that this is a, uh, an argument between Jews and Christians, that's totally implausible. Okay, so that's the first text. Now we'll go on to another text where I would say it's likely that we are dealing with uh, an argument 
between Jews and Christians. And uh, in the Mishnah and Brachot, uh, it, it describes the temple service that used to take place in the temple in Jerusalem. And it mentions that as part of the service, the daily service in the temple, they used to recite the Ten Commandments. And then both in the Bavli, both in the Babylonian Talmud and in the Jerusalem Talmud, there are passages, it's clearer in the Jerusalem Talmud, and that's why I gave you the text here from the Jerusalem Talmud. Bedin haya shiyukorin aseret hadibrot b'chol yom. Umibnei ma'in korin otam, mipnei ta'anot haminin shelo yiyu omrim elu levadan nitnu lo lemoshe v'sinai. It would be appropriate to read the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments in synagogue every day, the same way that they used to do it in the temple. And so why don't we do it? Why is that not part of our, uh, of our daily literature? Because of the claims of the minim, so that they not say that only these commandments were given to Moses at Mount Sinai. So we have a reference here to a group of minim, a group of Jewish sectarians who think that the only thing that is important is the Ten Commandments. Now, in the, uh, in the first century, there were many Jewish sects uh, in, in the land of Israel. Are these Christians? Well, actually, Rashi thought that these minim are Christians. In the lower left-hand corner of this slide, I gave you Rashi's comment on this, uh, the parallel passage to this in the Bafli. Rashi says, Haminin Talmidei Yeshu, the students of Jesus. So Rashi looked at this passage and Rashi was convinced that the Jews were adjusting their liturgy because of the teachings of the Christians. Uh, as I said, it's likely that this is correct. It's hard to find a, uh, a clear Christian text from the first or second century that says directly that only the Ten Commandments were given to Moses at Mount Sinai. There, there is some emphasis on the Ten Commandments, and, and we know that uh, early Christianity taught that uh, one did not have to observe all of the laws of the Torah. So, so it's, not a, it's not a giant jump to, to say what Rashi says here, that Haminim are Talmide Yeshu, the students of, uh, the students of Jesus. Uh, but just to make it a little more complicated here, how, how it's, not, it's not so simple to say that the, 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 the Christians emphasize the Ten Commandments. Here's, here's another New Testament passage uh, Paul writing in the second book to the Corinthians, uh, to uh, people who had, he had accepted the religion that he was teaching. It's hard to call it Christianity. It was, uh, it was a form of Messianic Judaism that, that, that he taught to the people who lived in Corinth. And he wrote to them this letter and he says to them, you yourselves are a letter of recommendation written on your hearts to be known and read by all men. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Now, Paul continues, if the dispensation of death carved in letters on stone came with such splendor that the Israelites could not look at Moses' face, then how much more so, Calva Homer, uh, 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 a fortiori, the, uh, the, the message that has been given to you. Paul here is referring to the Ten Commandments uh, the carved in letters on the stone, the, the, the tablets that Moses brought down from Mount Sinai. He's referring to it as the dispensation of death. So, so it, it's hard to say that, 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 that it was this clear teaching of the early church that the Ten Commandments were really important. I still think that, you know, it's likely that Rashi's explanation here is correct and that this is a passage where we, we have Jews and Christians uh, kind of jockeying with each other about the Bible uh, and the Christians 
perhaps saying that the Ten Commandments are all that counts, and then, then the Jews saying we should stop giving the Ten Commandments such an important position in our synagogue liturgy, um, and, and uh, and, and that's what they did. They stopped. Uh, they stopped reading it so that so that people would not come to the conclusion that the Ten Commandments are the only thing that counts in Judaism. Okay. So now we've seen a Talmudic text that it's uh, that it's implausible to say that it's a reference to Christians. We've seen a um, Talmudic text where it's likely that the reference is to Christians. And now we'll see one where I would say it's obvious that it's clear as day that we are talking about uh, Christians. Okay, the uh, uh, chapter of the Mishnah and the Gemara called Kol Kitvea Kodesh talks about what happens when a fire breaks out on Shabbat and are you allowed to save a Torah scroll or other holy books that are, uh, that are in danger of being consumed by the fire. And the Gemara says, Sifrei minim ein matzilim otam ibne hadleka, ela nisrafim bimkoman hein va'azkarotehem. The books of the minim should not be saved from a fire on Shabbat. They should be allowed to burn even the divine names mentioned in them. Okay, this phrase here, Sifre Minim, in theory, there are two possible understandings of what Sifre Minim mean. Sifre Minim could be books that were written by the sectarians. If, if Minim means uh, Christians, then that could mean a New Testament. Or it could mean holy books uh, that uh, are holy books like the book of Bereshi, Genesis, or Shemot, Exodus, uh, that, that, uh, that Minim wrote. And that's how Rashi understands it. And I, I would say that contextually, that has to be the interpretation here, he says. Minim, mesharetim la'avoda zara. Minim means uh, the, uh, the priests who uh, are in charge of, uh, of a... Uh, forbidden type of worship. That the text is talking about here, Minim, who wrote out a copy of the Sefer Torah, and they wrote it in Hebrew, and they wrote it the way that it's supposed to be written, but because it was written by a mean, then we don't save books like that from a fire on Shabbat. It isn't the words that uh, in themselves that have holiness, but it's the, the act of writing it. If, it. if it was written by people who aren't part of our, uh, of our religious group, then the book does not have, uh, have holiness. Uh, I thought, I thought to just point out for those of you who are interested in these things that, that Rashi says, Minim, he, he doesn't say, of the avodas are uh, people who uh, worship other uh, religions. He says mesharetim la avodas are. I've, I've been noticing that Rashi generally, when he uses the word minim, he assumes that it means the Christian leadership, and that it doesn't mean uh, the run-of-the-mill Christian on the street. Maybe we'll get back to that when we talk about Rashi in uh, in, a, in some weeks. And then the Gemara continues. Rabbi Meir have kare le aven gilayon. Rabbi Yochanan have kare le avon gilayon. Rabbi Meir called those books aven gilayon, and Rabbi Yochanan called them. Avon Gilayon. So Gilayon is, you know, a, a piece of paper, a piece of parchment. That's a that's a uh, that's a Gilayon. And Aven means vanity or nothingness, and Avon means a sin. So that is like the parchment of nothingness or the parchment of sin. And Rashi helps you understand what's going on here. Uh, just uh, a, a slight uh, footnote here. Uh, I, I'm, deal, I, I'm using here the uncensored texts of the Talmud and the uncensored text of Rashi. And, and many 
copies of the Talmud, even the ones that are printed today, sometimes do not have these passages in them. Um, and the Jews in Christian countries sometimes were not allowed to have a text like this, but Jews in Muslim countries were allowed to have a text like this. So we do have the original, uh, the original text. Uh, for those of you who have tuned in from Toronto and who are as old or almost as old as, uh, as I am, uh, I, had, uh, I remember I had a teacher many years ago, Rabbi Abraham Yehuda uh, Wise, wonderful man, great teacher. I learned, learned a lot of Torah from him. And I remember when I was a student in yeshiva here in Israel, and I brought back a Gemara that, uh, that had been printed here in Israel, and he saw it, and he looked at it, and he saw that they had restored into the text some of these passages that make direct references to, uh, to Christians, and he was, uh, he was surprised, and he knew the passages by heart. He said that in his yeshiva in Europe, they even though the passages weren't written in the Talmud because they weren't allowed to print something like this in the Talmud that uh, it was seen as opposing Christianity, the yeshiva boys knew these things by heart. And he, you know, he, he looked in the Gemara and then he closed up the Gemara and then he recited the passage by heart, even though he'd never seen it written uh, before that. So Rashi explains here in the uncensored version of Rashi, Rashi explains here, Rabbi Meir called the books of the Minim Aven Gilayon because they call the books Evangelion. That this is a play on words that the Christians say that they have the good news, the Evangelion, the Evangelion there for those of you who could read the, the Greek uh, letters. And so Rabbi, so here we see that Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Yochanan, a rabbi in the second century and a rabbi at the beginning of the third century are, you know, they're aware of the Christians and they're making fun of the Christian books in this, uh, in, in this passage that's dealing directly with the concept of Sifrei Minim, the books of the Minim. Um, the passage in the Talmud there continues. Ima Shalom, the wife of Rabbi Eliezer, was the sister of Rabban Gamliel II in the late first century. There was a philosopher, Haba uh, Hahu Philosopher Veshabavute. There was a philosopher in their neighborhood who acquired a reputation that he did not accept bribes. They wanted to mock him and reveal his true nature. So, so she gave him an expensive gift. She gave him a golden lav, lamp. And then she and her brother came before him for judgment. Okay, so it's a text about a philosopher. You know, the Talmud doesn't make it clear uh, who this person is and, and referring to early Christians as being philosophers is not, it's not really all that accurate. The, the early Christians were no more philosophers than, uh, than uh, Ima Shalom or Rabbi Eliezer or Rabban, uh, Rabban Gamliel, but it's possible that this is just like a code word that was used in the text. Uh, so I'm just, uh, uh, want to tell everybody I'm, I'm going to look at the chat when we get to the last 10 minutes and I'll pick up questions but I'm not going to uh, uh, I find it difficult to teach and look at the chat at the same time. Uh, Rashi writing uh, his commentary on that passage in Shabbat says what's a philosopha? It means a mean and for Rashi usually the word mean means Christian and uh, we'll see from the continuation of the passage, it's pretty darn clear. It's uh, bordering on the obvious that we are dealing with a, an incident of a rabbi and his sister encountering a Christian in the first century. Uh, Tosvot say here, uh, mean could perish a contrast, that a philosopher is a mean, presumably a Christian, as uh, Rashi explained. 
ורבנו שמע מיהודי אחד שבא מארץ יוון ואמר, בלשון יוון פילוסופוס הוא דוד החוכמה. The Tosfot doing good research, they talked with a Jew who showed up from Greece there in northern France or Germany where the Tosfots were living, and they asked this uh, this uh, Greek Jew, do you have any idea what this word in the Talmud means, uh, philosophus? And this Greek Jew who knows the Greek word says that a philosophus is dod ha the lover of wisdom, dod in the sense of, uh, of lover, in the sense uh, that the word dod is used in the Song of Songs, uh, a, a lover of wisdom. Uh, there are those who read the word here not as philosopha, but as philisaba, which is connected to an Aramaic word for mockery and laughter. Uh, what do I find interesting in this text? Rashi and Tosfot are so far away from the world of philosophy there in northern France that they... they, they, uh, they don't know what the word philosopher means. And uh, they're, they're struggling here, but they know, they do know how to read a Talmudic passage extremely well. And uh, Rashi understands that this philosopha who's being referred to here must be a Christian, as we will see from the continuation of the, uh, of the text. Um, this is, uh, you know, the Tosfot writing presumably around the same time that perhaps the greatest Jewish uh, philosopher ever, uh, Rambam, was uh, in, in Spartac lands, was, uh, was promoting Jewish philosophy, and the Tosafists, uh, the, the, the Tosafists are struggling with the understanding of what this word means. But as we'll see, uh, it clearly, in this context, it's a reference to a Christian. Okay, so we saw that she gave an expensive gift to this, uh, to this judge as a bribe, even though he had a reputation that he didn't accept bribes, but they didn't believe that. They were sure that uh, it wouldn't be so difficult to give a bribe to this guy. So she gave him an expensive gift, a golden lamp, and then she and her brother came before him for judgment. She said to the philosopher, I want to share in the inheritance of my father's estate. He said to them, But the brother said, Rabban Gamliel said to him, in our Torah, oh, I'm sorry. Before that, she says to the philosopher, I want, I want 50% of our dead father's estate. And, and he said, Amar le implobu. He said, sure, you get half of the estate. He said to them, uh, Rabban Gamliel said to him, but it's written in our Torah, when the father has a son, the daughter does not inherit. The philosopher said to him, since the day you were exiled from your land, the Torah of Moses was taken away and the Avon Gilayon was given in its place. And there it is written that a son and a daughter inherit equally. In some Talmudic texts, it doesn't say it yahavit Avon Gilayon. It says, uh, it says it yahavit Torah uh, or Raita Achrita, a different Torah. But it's the same idea. But they just wanted to tone tone it down here by saying that, they, that like the Avangelion, the Evangelion, has replaced the Torah. And in the Evangelion, it says that a son and a daughter inherit equally. Now, it does not say anywhere in the New Testament that a son and a daughter inherit equally. If you really want to stand on your head and try to find a passage in the New Testament that comes close to saying it, there's another passage here, again from Paul, uh, a, a famous passage that is often quoted today by uh, Christian feminists, uh, that uh, Paul said, uh, the lower left-hand corner of this slide, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. But 
Paul was not a feminist, and you read in other writing, writings of his, he's uh, very clear uh, about how, how uh, a man should, should behave in church and how a woman should be, be behaving in church. And Paul said that, you know, the man behaves one way because he has like this direct kind of a relationship with God, but the woman is under the control of her husband. So she, behaves, she should behave differently, uh, differently in church because she doesn't have a direct relation. So, so he was no feminist, Paul. And all, all he's saying here is that in order to get saved, it doesn't matter if you were Jewish or not Jewish. It doesn't matter whether you're a free person or a slave. It, 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 it isn't that Paul was against slavery. It just it says if you want to get saved, it doesn't matter whether you're a slave or free, and it doesn't matter whether you're male or female. But maybe, uh, maybe if you wanted to say that there's a reference here to this passage, okay, that the, it, it's theoretically possible, unlikely, but the idea that since the days that the Jews were exiled from their land, the Torah of Moses has been taken away and the Avon Gilayon has been given in its place. That's pretty darn clear that we're dealing here with a Christian who is saying something of this nature. And so because of the uh, bribe that he received from the woman from Ima Shalom, he says that she gets half of the uh, half of the text, even though uh, half of the estate, even though the text in the Torah makes it clear that when there are, uh, as Rabban Gamliel put it, bimkom uh, bra uh, barta lo terot, when there when the father has a son, the daughter does not inherit. I remember when I was a little kid and I was studying Chumash with my father. I have two sisters and no brothers. And I can't, we came to the passage in, uh, in the Midbar where it makes it clear that the son inherits and not the, uh, and not the daughter. So, you know, I said to my father, oh, the son gets everything. I remember my father saying to me, we don't do it that way anymore, Marty. And, uh, uh, so, but, but, but the teaching of the Torah is very clear on this subject, but that's not the end of the story. The next day, Rabban Gamliel brought the philosophia, a philosopher, a Libyan donkey. I, I, I don't know what makes a Libyan donkey uh, superior to other donkeys, but apparently it is. Um, and and uh, so Rabban Gamliel tries to outdo his sister by bringing a more expensive, uh, more valuable present. And afterwards, he and his sister again come before the philosopher for judgment. He said to them, uh, Amar lahu, shvilit l'sefa de sifra. I, I just love the, putting these Aramaic, uh, Talmudic Aramaic words into the mouth of this Christian. You know, I, I look to the end of the, uh, uh, to the end of the book, the uh, chatav Ana lala mifchat minoraita de Moshe atiti, the lola osufi al oraita de Moshe atiti, or according to some manuscripts, ela lo osufi al oraita de Moshe atiti. I look to the end of the book, and it is written there I come not to subtract from the Torah of Moses, nor did I come, or other texts read, rather I came to add to the Torah of Moses. And in the Torah of Moses, it is written, when there is a son, the daughter does not inherit. So he's now ruling after he's gotten the bribe from the man, he's ruling in favor of the man who wants to get 100% of the estate. She said to him, may your light shine like a lamp. You know, she elbows him, lamp, lamp. Remember, the, remember, remember that bribe that I gave you, uh, uh, and then Rabban Gamliel said, the donkey apparently came and kicked over the lamp. That uh, my, my bribe was better than your bribe. And that's, uh, that's what uh, has happened. This is probably the only example in, the, in Talmudic literature. It's hard to make a statement like that about Talmudic literature. But I think this is probably the only example in Talmudic literature of a quotation of a passage from the New Testament in the 
uh, in the Talmud. And uh, it's pretty clear that the passage uh, that, that is being quoted here, it comes from the, uh, the lead up to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter five. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. This is Jesus speaking. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. In the old King James uh, translation, it says, not one jot, not one tittle. Uh, and uh, it, it probably, probably what the, the, the original saying was, Kotso shall you, the, the, you know, even the, even the tip of, of the tiniest letter, the, like the, the little tip at the top of the letter Yud, even nothing from the law will, will pass uh, until all is accomplished, until the end of times. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus, according to Matthew, teaches that in fact, a Christian has to be more righteous than the scribes and the Pharisees, that, not, that there isn't any cancellation of the laws of the, uh, uh, of the Hebrew Bible, and that uh, I, I've come to give you higher standards. And, and for those of you who ever read the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Mount goes through that, you know, here is what you have been taught, but I actually ask you to do more than what you were, uh, you were taught by the rabbis. And so that's this quotation here. I came not to subtract from the Torah of Moses, nor did I come, or rather I came to add to uh, actually the text, if it reads El Alo Sufi Al Oraita de Moshe, it, it's probably a, uh, a, a closer to the text in, in Matthew. So here is one of the few texts in the, in, in the Talmud where we can say, I think with something approaching certainty that we are dealing with uh, rabbis who are uh, a rabbi and a sister who are coming in contact with a Christian teacher. And the other thing that's interesting about this text is that this, is, this might be the, uh, the Talmudic text that has the clearest kind of criticism of Christianity on a, a kind of idea level, because uh, th this text is pointing out the contradiction between two things that you can hear being taught by Christians in the first and second centuries, and also by some Christians in later centuries. Some of them are teaching that uh, the Torah of Moses has been taken away and the Avon Gilayon has been uh, given in its place. That's, that is a teaching that you can find early Christians uh, saying, it, we don't have to pay attention so much to, somebody like Paul was definitely saying something like that, the, don't pay attention anymore to the Torah of Moses because now we have, uh, we, we have our holy teachings. And, the, uh, and, the, and Matthew, who is teaching that Jesus actually came to, make things more stringent, not to remove any of the laws of the Torah, but to be more demanding uh, of, of his followers than the laws of the Torah were. And so th this is, I see this text as kind of pointing out that kind of internal contradiction within early Christianity and to some degree within later Christianity also. Is the, is the law still valid or is it not valid anymore. So here's a, here's a clear, clear uh, text that teach, shows you Jews and Christians in the first century talking about the, uh, talking about the Bible. Okay, and maybe one last issue that we will deal with uh, today, uh, a text from the Talmud, another text from the Talmud uh, that doesn't look like it has anything to do with Jesus, but we will uh, consider the possibility that it does. Amar lehu, amar lehahu mina le A certain min 
once asked Rabbi Hanina in the early second century, just to review, a mean could mean a Christian or it could be some other sectarian. Have you ever heard how old Bilam was when he died? It's a strange question to be asking, but anyways, uh, Bilam, they talk about him in the Torah. The, the, there aren't that many people in the Torah uh, whose ages we know at their death, though only some of the most uh, important people like uh, Avram, Yitzhak, Yaakov, Moshe, people like that, we know uh, something about their age at death. But do you happen to know how old Bilam was when he died? And Rabbi Hanina answered, Mirtav lochtiv. The answer isn't written explicitly. Ella midichtiv anshe tamim umirma lo yechetsu yemehem bar taltin utlachnin o bar taltin va'arba. Since it says, murderous, treacherous men shall not live out half their days, I conclude that a murderous, treacherous person like Bilam must have been either 33 or 34 years old when he died because the uh, lifespan uh, of, a, uh, of a person is, uh, is 70 years. Yemesh noteno bahem shivim shana. And so uh, it says in Tehillim that, uh, that murderous, treacherous people don't live out half of their days. So I'm guessing that Bilam was 33 or 34 years old when, uh, when he uh, died. The mean answered, Shapir Ka'amart, you have spoken well. Chazili Pinkase de Bilam. I saw the booklet of Bilam. What's the booklet of Bilam? No idea what the booklet of Bilam is. Chazili Pinkase de Bilam, Vahave Ktiv Bey, Bartaltin Utlachnin, Bilam Chagira, Kad Katil Yate, Pinchas Listaa. I saw that it's written in the booklet of Bilam that Bilam the lame was 33 years old when he was killed by Pinchas Listaa. The Hebrew, the Aramaic word listaa is the, uh, the, the the Hebrew word listim, which comes actually from the Greek word listis, uh, which means a, a highwayman, a, a highway robber. So Bilam the lame was killed when, uh, when it was 33 years old when he was killed by Pinchas Listaa. Okay, so why is Bilam being called the lame? It's possible because in the story of Bilam in the book of the Midbar, there's a story of the donkey crushing uh, Bilam's uh, leg into the uh, into the wall. So maybe that's why he's called uh, he's called Bilam the lame. But why, if if Pinchas here is the Pinchas of the Bible, why in the world would Pinchas be called Pinchas Lista. Uh, and now I'm going to take a look at the chat in case, uh, any, or if anybody wants to unmute themselves and just suggest what might Pinchas Lista sound like? Not what the words mean, but what does Pinchas Lista sound like? Any suggestions? Lista. Yes. Now, so list, list, uh, I mean, Pinchas was a list tem, a murderer, a gangster, a person. The Pinchas who was a gangster, sword. but but the biblical Pinchas that we know wasn't a murderer, wasn't a gangster. So why is he being called? Uh, yes, he was. Uh, yes, well, he was. Uh, ah, because he killed the the. Uh, but, but the Bible praises him for doing that. So so it's that doesn't very, mean that he wasn't a look. Right. Most okay. Rabbeinu, the first thing he does is kill somebody. Did he really right. have to kill the Egyptian taskmaster? He right. could have just beat him up the way he did with shepherds that were attacking but not, well, right. there was no okay. reason to shed blood. Okay. In other words, this goes with Shavit Levy from day one, what they did Thank in Shem. Thank you. But I, I want to talk for a second about what those words sound like as opposed to what they mean. Does anybody, did they resonate with you in any way, those words, Pinchas Lista'a, that Bilam 
was 33 years old when he was killed by Pinchas Listaa. How about Pontius Pilate? Very good. Thank you very much. This suggestion has been made by many scholars, and I find it convincing that that is what this text is saying, and that Bilam is, and we shall see a number of texts in the series of classes that we're going to have on this subject, where Bilam is being used as a code word for Jesus. And when Jesus was killed by Pontius Pilate, Pinchas Lista'a, he was 33 years old. Why is it being used as a code word? Because it was difficult in certain periods to write uh, clearly about, about Jesus. And so there's a code word here. And Bilam is a non-Jewish prophet. And Jesus is seen as the kind of founder of, uh, of this non-Jewish religion, even though Jesus himself uh, was, uh, was Jewish. And in fact, it is an extremely common Christian teaching that Jesus was 33 or 34 years old when he was killed. I just found this Christian website. Luke 3.23 indicates that Jesus was about 30 years old when he began his earthly ministry, which lasted for three to three and a half years. So among scholars, the most common estimate is that Jesus was 33 to 34 years old at the time of his death. This is not the only opinion that's found in the New Testament, because some people point to a verse in John where it says, the Jews said to him, to Jesus, you aren't even 50 years old yet. If somebody is 33, you might say to them, you're not even 40 years old yet. It's unlikely that you would say you're not even 50 years old. So some people uh, disagree about this, but way back in uh, going back to earliest days of Christianity, there was a common feeling that Jesus died at age 33 or 34. And so this uh, text here where he says, I, I conclude that he must have been 33 or 34 years old. This is, uh, I think, fairly clearly, fairly likely that we have a text here that is the rabbis relating to, uh, relating to Jesus. And I just put it here onto the slide what Solomon Seitlin in his uh, article about the chronology of Jesus says, he was born sometime between 6 BCE and 6 CE, and he was crucified by the Romans sometime between the year 30 and uh, 35. So the, the age of being uh, around 33 or 34 when he died is, uh, is reasonable enough. Okay, I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen so that I can see uh, more of you and we can take a look at the, uh, at the chat. And if, uh, Rabbi Kelman, are you here? I am here, yes. I just arrived a few minutes ago, thank you. But go. Well, uh, very good. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, do you want to? Uh... Uh, the, you know what, I, I can do it, although considering I missed all the lecture. Okay. Um, but I, I, I'm, by the way- Okay, I'll, 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 I'll do it. I yes. don't have the, the, the chat. When you come on late, you only see the chat from when you came on. So I don't oh, have to okay. the chat. So I only uh -huh. got on at 11.49, only the chats from then. Okay. Uh, so very I'm good. sorry. I'm sorry. N not a problem. Yes. Uh, so uh, someone writes here, as the Christians have internal contradiction, we have not come to take away. We also have some contradictions, like interest rate, pro school, 100%. That's true. That, uh, very true. And uh, these crit criticisms, I see somebody came up with the answer, Pontius Pilate, through the, uh, uh, through, uh, the chat. Thank you very much. Uh, yes. Yes. Is the word evangelical connected to Avon Gilayon? No, it isn't. Uh, even though it, it, it's being used in that way as a play on it, uh, the you Angelion means the good news. It's Greek words, uh, Greek words that mean uh, good news. And so the, the, that's where Evangelion came along. The Jews heard it and they said, oh, it's not good news. It's avon gilayon. It's, uh, it's uh, parchment of, uh, parch no, 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 no. parchments of sin. Uh, let's see some of the 
earlier uh, mm-hmm. comment here. What is Ktav, uh, Ktav Ashurit? Ktav Ashurit means the way that a Torah scroll should be written, the kind of lettering that we use uh, in, in, in a Torah scroll, as opposed, to, sometimes in the Talmud it, it means as opposed to the early Proto-Hebrew uh, script, a Torah scroll is not supposed to be written in the Proto-Hebrew script, it's written in Ktav Ashurit. Could there have been another sect referred to in the Yerushalmi? Sure, Susanna, it could be. Uh, and is the word mean used by censors instead of some other phrase? I, I don't think that that happens all that, uh, happens all that often. And that in fact, the word mean often gets re- removed by the, uh, uh, by the censors. Uh, oh, I see someone answered. Uh, the question, Ksav Ashurit, the script that we use now in a uh, Sefer Torah. Uh, yes, and Rav Steinsalt uh, consistently in his Talmud has restored the passages that, uh, yes, yes. And someone says here uh, that story about uh, uh, Ima Shalom and Rabban Gamliel might call it entrapment uh, by uh, trying to, uh, t- trying to. Fair point, yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, do you think that Avon Gilayon is polemical transliteration? For sure, Linda, uh, 100%. Uh, okay. Can we say something orally too? Please, go ahead. Um, I remember reading in a sense of Shas and Stein's out since on Hedron 43A the statement reading as follows. Yeshu hanotri hayat tamid chacham shehitiach tapshilo barabim. Okay, we're going to be doing that text next week. Okay, fine. <laughs> we're on the same wavelength. You and I were okay. thinking the same. Yes. Any other uh, comments or uh, questions that uh, anybody would like to share at this, uh, at this point? Marty? Marty? Yes. Um, at which it's pearly. At which point do you know that the Torah that the Christians eliminated the compulsory aspects of the Torah except for the Ten Commandments? Like it, it, it makes sense that that's what they would do when, once they're out with pa- converting pagans. But when did it really happen? Yes. So. Uh, 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 I agree with your assessment, Pearly, that it presumably happened when Paul was uh, peddling his religion in the uh, in the Mediterranean world. Paul was the one who said uh, who said most clearly that, uh, and the first one who said uh, clearly that uh, that uh, to be Christian you shouldn't be circumcised and. If you wish to be circumcised, then uh, Jesus will be of no use to you. That you, you know, you have to decide. Either you're trying to do things through mitzvot, or you're trying to do things through Jesus. And so, uh, it, it's very unlikely that the uh, early Christians who were in the land of Israel were teaching something like this. It is likely that they were teaching that uh, that the mitzvot should be followed, perhaps with some relaxation of some of the mitzvot. But when Paul, there's some really interesting stories in the New Testament of Paul coming back to the land of Israel with people who had, he had converted with men whom he had converted to this religion, we could call it Christianity or, uh, or Messianic Judaism, and they weren't circumcised and, 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 and everybody was just kind of scratching their head. These people have converted and they're not, uh, they're, they're not circumcised. So, so when, when this started happening, when, when the spreading of the Christian message of the message of Jesus to the Jews in the land of Israel was not being particularly successful, but, this, but the spreading of this, uh, 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 of this message in other places in the Mediterranean world started to be successful, that's when uh, we start hearing that, uh, <clears throat> that, that's when we start hearing the, this idea that the, the mitzvot are no longer of any importance within this religion. Marty, I want to ask you. Thank you. Please. Marty, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, 
Philosophia. Could that mean adding knowledge? Which word? Philosophia. Ah, adding uh, adding knowledge. Well, uh, I don't know. Uh, I I think that the Jew who came from Greece was right. <laughs> that philosopher means uh, the, the lover of wisdom. That's what they taught me in my Greek classes. That that's what uh, that that's what uh, philosoph. Uh, no, but that that discussion on Asaf may be an awareness of the wordplay that to which I'm drawing your attention. Aha. Uh Aha. -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. We're thinking about. Thank you.